All right, so hi and welcome to this online session on how to become a more effective developer. I'm really happy that I can do this session here on my YouTube channel and I also, well, want to make this a little bit interactive. So if you've uh, joined me on some live streaming fun before, then you know um, you very well can uh, use the chat to ask questions. So that's always, um, always desired if you have some questions. So let me just write something in the chat. You can just say hello. It always also helps if you tell me whether uh, sound and video is uh, looking and uh, hearing good, sounding good. And tell me from where you're watching. And in this session also you can just ask some questions. Once in a while I will just have a look at the chat and see uh, how we're doing. And yeah, please feel free to ask anything on this topic. So about what I want to show you is some tips and experiences on how to become a more effective developer. So what helped me over the years and uh, of course there's a lot to this topic uh, to be said, whether it's some tips and tricks on how to use your tools and how to you know get better at time management and planning and even you know like taking a rest on how to uh, build up your workplace and your office and your environment, you know what is the best keyboard, what is the best screen and all of these things. Um, but just you know some compilation of my tips and experiences. So let's go right into it and don't worry, I don't have too many slides, but a few things. So first of all, we should foster and use automation. So that's a very important thing because in my mind, using automation as a developer means basically using the computer in the correct way because computers are really good at implementing automation. And we human beings, we're not that great at that because while well, we make mistakes, we get bored and you know, all of these things. So Automation, if you think about it, it comes in uh, big uh, things and well, in big forms and in small forms and something even like, you know, uh, keyboard shortcuts is uh, already a form of automation, right? Or of course, using some scripts and your favorite IDE and um, all of these things. So just automation in general uh, helps us a lot. So basically what I want to show you um, first is some basic IDE usage. So I use um, IntelliJ here. So best IDE out there and let me just quickly switch this to bigger for example what did I just do well if you think about it that was already some sort of automation I mean I did two things because I didn't prepare the setup I quickly switched the font size to something bigger so that's um, the color scheme that uh, this is called that you can switch here you can have a look at my keyboard what I'm doing there and if you got some questions about um, you know, some specific uh, setup there, just ask, you know, I can, I will point you to some um, dot files and configuration there. But I also mean this, right, because that's already using an automation and IDE feature to generate code, for instance. So I didn't write, you know, package, com, Sebastian Dashner, blah, blah, blah. I just generated this, right? In the same way, if you just use any form to, for example, generate a main method that is, for example, called live template in IntelliJ, that is just using some feature, you know, some of these shortcuts uh, by typing main, for instance, and then hitting tab and expanding it with it, that is already some automation. And this is very important to mention, I think, because it very much is the distinction between what we are good at as human beings and what the computer is good at. For example, if you say it makes a lot of sense to think about your code, your code structures, what a good name is, how we can really express our intentions well in our code and then using some automation features from the IDE mainly in order to implement it, in order to execute it. For example, if you would like to, well, define a variable, right? Uh, something like, I don't know, um, hello world, and then say define variable hello, right? And you would like to rename this. Okay, uh, assuming you use this variable in a, a bunch of ways, then of course it makes sense to use some renaming feature. Right. So if I say, well, it makes a lot of sense to think um, a lot about this variable name or about this uh, class name here. So that is a work that we uh, humans are really good at. Right. So this creative type of work this what is a good way for this method name um, to name it for this class name and all of it and then to execute it using the computer. So I don't want to go to these 200 um, occurrences of this um, uh, in this code project where this class name um, occurs. But instead, I would like to use some feature, for example, rename, you know, in order to rename this and then hit enter 
and of course my IDE will make sure it is being renamed properly. Okay, but the same is true um, among methods and all of these things. So for example, if I would uh, like to say print something, you know, in order just as a shortcut to say do uh, something here or do something else or do yet something else, if I would like to have this to be refactored into a method. Now, this is again the point where automation helps. And what I would like to uh, uh, for you to get to take away as a tip is the following that you separate some somewhat the, the work here in this way of thinking, what is some work where really I as a human can, can shine to do some complex way um, of thinking to say, what is a really good way to structure this code like you know what uh, how should i outsource it or um emit into another method and how should this method be named and you know this is what we think out all, all day uh, think about as developers while we're staring at the wall and that is valuable work right because the better we are into defining these structures and code that expresses itself well well you know the more readable and comprehensive your your code becomes but also we should then not spend our time like creating these structures, at least not too much, because, well, the computer is just better at that. So, for example, if I say that should be a private static void uh, do something method, something like this. And, you know, then I take my code, of course, then copy it, paste it down there. And then I should not forget to call this method um, here to invoke this method at all of the appropriate places. Well, that's not the best thing. So instead, what I can do, you know, I can go right click and say, well, refactor extract method, for example. So that's, of course, an automation feature for it. So that's one thing. And then I say do something and you see it already, you know, invokes this at the correct places. And even if your IDE is intelligent, like in IntelliJ here, it will then suggest you even other places. So, for example, if you say, let's try this out, if I have this code here and there, and down there and if I say well please take these two lines of code and then say well right click refactor um, extract method do something here it will actually ask you hey by the way I detected that here and there you could also uh, do this or maybe accept some signature change um, to make it more efficient so that's one thing um, and here I actually now expected that it would uh, invoke this here as well but I think it doesn't work with uh, system out um, that nicely so then I could just replace this here but you see the computer is just better at well uh, implementing that all together and I can even say inline all and remove method to undo this but basically what you also will find when you've done this a hundred times that right click refactor extract method is just a little bit annoying so you if you can read this here you go to uh, press Control alt m instead which is what I'm doing so this is also, if you think about it, let's try this with the signature change and replace all, then it does something funny here. So that's okay. Um, also interesting, but that is just much faster. So if you think about it, that is just using automation per se as well. So that's one thing, um, of course, IDE features. I also showed you some live templates. There is also a nice uh, possibility to define your own live template. So what is a live template? That is basically uh, how I created this main or the system out um, here. So for example, if it would um, like to print this, you can go to your IDE settings and define your own ones. This is also always helpful. And with that, you know, you just make a better, I would say, use of your time. So. If you think about it, there's probably a shortcut for that, especially with the tools that we use a lot. This is really an important tip. You know, I know you cannot remember all of uh, every single shortcut that's out there in the world, but for some tools and the IDE or the command line or, you know, whatever tools you're using is certainly one of it. It really makes sense to become a power user of that tool to say, OK, what are actually the features that I use a lot? And, you know, is there a better way to do something or especially if the, um, if there is a shortcut for that? And in all of the IDEs, the, the answer is probably yes, because you can do pretty much everything just using the keyboard. And especially IntelliJ is really, really good at that. Like they have a really well thought out keyboard concept where once you get into it, you know, like extract a method with M, a variable with V, a, par a parameter with P and so on and so forth. It really has, you know, it, it has some uh, a sense to it. It has a certain structure where it can memorize them well. 
And once you get used to them, it just really helps and makes you more productive. I also, um, you can check out my um, a Twitter account. I will share, share it at the end uh, where I started uh, some thread about this uh, year's uh, challenge to learn a new shortcut uh, every month or even more often than that where I'm sharing my favorite IntelliJ shortcuts. You know, it, it's just um, a helpful thing to be a little bit uh, more productive with that. So that's certainly something that you can uh, try out. Um, I've showed you some refactoring features and live templates. You can check check out also some of my content uh, there because it's, I think, really uh, just helpful. All right, let me have a quick look at the chat if there's a, a question. Saludos desde Medellín, Colombia. Hi, hi back to Colombia. Very nice, beautiful city. I um, really enjoyed my time there. So if you have some questions, please uh, paste it into the chat. You can ask this live and, well, then next tip, what is really helpful and you've probably if you consume some of my content, you've seen this that I'm a big fan of the command line. So use the force. Uh, no, use the command line. This is definitely something that I can tell to all of the developers because, you know, once you get used to the command line and when I say command line, I mostly say Unix command line. This really helps you in getting more effective. Why? Because the command line will first of it, first of all, so that's my command line here. Um, you can just type, which is always helpful, which we'll see in a second as well. But also you can just well execute all sorts of commands. And especially in the Unix and Linux world, you can do pretty much everything that the computer can do by using the command line and you can automate very easily. So for instance, for instance, if I say, well, you know, what do we typically do? We do something like, you know, invoke our Maven or other build tool using the command line by just typing something like, you know, Maven clean package or whatever have you. So this is something that you uh, certainly can do. Or, you know, you might have your typical Git um, command here. So this is something what I do. I always use Git on a command line or, you know, you have your Docker run command and things like that. So this is just very easy to do on a command line, you know, because rather than wielding the mouse around, you can just like type your commands here. And once you get used to that, it's really, really helpful. There are thousands and thousands of tips and tricks there, how to make your life a well, while easier on the command line. But I want to show you the ones that helped me the most. And again, I will uh, also point you to a lot of uh, content I've produced on, on this front. So I think that's just a very cool and very helpful topic. Uh, but the most helpful tips is, well, first of all, shell, shell aliases. So what that is, that is just something that allows you to quickly type something like Maven clean package, for example, by saying, you know, an alias like this. There's also a way to expand these aliases, which I think is really helpful because then I actually see what I'm typing there. Um, some aliases might you might uh, define to not expand. I'll uh, point you to some more content like how to define them in, in different ways. And you can check out my, my dot files on, on GitHub later as well. But basically, that's just this because then you can say, okay, how to do a Docker run, how to do a, I don't know, cube control get pods if you use uh, Kubernetes, how to do a, um, a git status, you know, or um, a git push or things like that. Um, or even there are some other um, commands that if you would let me just see one thing, um, be testing one repository that I have, for example, if I say, uh, git graph. That's another thing that I defined. It's a little bit smaller that you actually see some nice uh, thing there, which is also an alias and also a script for just, um, well, printing something in a nicer way. Um, so you can just quickly um, navigate in your code. So basically uh, define and um, define and execute commands faster. So this is just really helpful because then, you know, how many times did you type maven, clean package, skip tests and things like that. So there's just, you know, an easier way to do this. And, you know, you don't even have to remember these commands. So this is what I find nicer than, you know, you might know um, about control R and then um, hitting the search. So for example, do a backward search uh, to have something like maven, something like this. But it's just faster to use these uh, aliases because then you know how do I f um, execute integration tests you don't need to remember them and you know it's just uh, quicker to type that's one thing and another thing uh, um, are shell shortcuts what that is 
or how I named them as such, is just the shortcuts that you can press mostly using control. So what clear does, that for example, that clears something, right? But you can do the same by hitting control L. Or there are a few other ones where you can, you know, jump to the beginning of the line, end of the line and things like that. But what is even more helpful is to define your own one. So for example, I have one that just displays the current, um, well, folder, the current contents, which is for me control K because it's located next to L, right? Or H in order to um, display a hierarchy or J smaller hierarchy, right? So what is the current folder? You know, I have these um, two directories and one file. And how does this look like in a um, greater hierarchy and greater hierarchy? That's basically a, a tree uh, command, this one. And it's just quicker to navigate. So this is really cool because then you get really fast of just navigating the command line, especially if you use um, a, sh a shell such as Z shell, um, especially with the oh my Z shell extension. So that's always what I advocate for because I really like um, the file navigation or directory navigation, I should say, in the shell. So for example, what you've seen before, if I want to go to some um, directory, so for example, my workspace of this uh, coffee shop uh, repository, I just, you know, can auto expand um, directories, multiple hierarchies by hitting tab once and then I just uh, go there and I can press enter so I don't have to type CD and all of these things and I can go uh, back into the last directories by, you know, some shortcuts and things like that. It's just really cool to navigate there and once you get used to it, it's actually much nicer than any file explorer. So you will like this more, I promise. And once you get used to it, so you actually want to use, you know, copy, a move, and all of these Unix commands to handle your file system, which is actually, it sounds weird, but which is what I'm doing, because with that, you can navigate this uh, really nicely. And of course, with regards to automation, that's a nice thing to do on the command line as well, because for example, if I say um, how to automate something on the command line, well, very easily, I just go and you know write my commands into a plain text file so for example maven clean package uh, docker build docker run things like that and then i go you know save the file here uh, make it executable and then i can execute this and then we'll then it will just you know one by one execute these commands which is super basic i know but also very pragmatic because then you write these shell scripts and you can lean back and you know sip your coffee or, or water while your stuff is executing which is just another nice way of doing automation by um, putting that that stuff into the command line there are a few other tools um, i mean there are many unix tools uh, that i can recommend or that are my favorite ones uh, one is certainly uh, the jq tool which you can nicely uh, pipe with some other commands so for example let's have a, a quick uh, json file here hello world something like this where i say this is my uh, file which that is actually another tool so my cat uh, actually is an alias for bat which is another uh, command here because usually it wouldn't look as nicely and then if i uh, go and actually pipe this into a jq command then well you see first of all some syntax highlighting but also then i can say well just for example um, take this one key in this json and display it not qr and display it here without uh, the quotes and things like that and then take this and i don't know do a, a base64 encoding or whatever have you and then a decoding just because you can. So this is just really cool, especially once you combine this with, you know, your code, your applications and API using curl or wget or HTTP or some command line tool as an HTTP client and things like this, which is really cool just for using some automation. So then you can uh, script together, um, you know, the stuff that helps you just as some uh, some tools there and you know using the command line there more uh, effectively another tool that i'm using instead of ls actually that is also it's called exa which gives me a little bit nicer coloring and um you know information here for doing the ls thingy that's just helpful for me but that's you know basically it you will find your own uh, tools once you go down uh, this uh, rabbit hole so we have a question in chat instead of using a plugin like Zisha auto suggestion it's more quick to use uh 
to, to just use control R. Yes, hi back to Brazil, by the way. So auto suggestion, I'm not actually a big fan of these auto suggestions. There are, I don't have an example here right now, but basically when you type something, then they might uh, suggest you just what you might have. But I'm really a fan of doing the automation thing more deliberately. So I tell the computer what to do for most of the commands, right? It would be nice if sometimes, you know, a suggestion, I like this more in the IDE, you know, I, you know, sometimes I rename something and tells me, hey, do you want to also want to uh, rename your comments or th uh, things like that. But for the command line, I almost always, you know, kind of like know what I want to do. I use the backward search only if it's a command that I very rarely use and then see, okay, what did I actually do? And more like, a, you know, looking at the history. But in order to execute something, I either type, you know, put this into a script or have it in an alias or just type it myself. Because quite often I also hit, you know, control R and then I was too fast and I mistakenly executed the wrong command. And on a command line, this can be really, um, uh, really a problem. So this this is just what I like more. So I know a lot of people suggested this to me as well with some fuzzy search and some uh, tools that you can use on the command line. But I'm actually more a fan of, you know, doing this um, the alias uh, way and then just executing what you want. And for example, another nice uh, thing was um, control G for, um, well, you don't see it here, for typing git status. So instead of doing git status, you can, for example, use this alias, but what I just have is control, uh, is control G because I typed it so often. Um, so that just made more sense, you know? So these are basically, that's control K and you know, these are my shell shortcuts, what I was uh, uh, talking about before, that you can define your own ones. Again, I will uh, point you to my dot file so you can uh, try this out uh, as well. But it's basically just, you know, trying to make this a little bit more accessible. So really, if you think for yourself, you will come up with your own things that you just use all the time, which again goes back to the same idea what I was saying earlier with this automation, right? There are some automation where the computer helps us a lot and somewhere we just say, actually, why am I doing this, you know, myself as a human being, right? And some of the things like stuff that I type all over again, hey, why don't you just find a way to uh, execute this a little bit better using the keyboard, for example, you know, such a shortcut such as or control uh, G doesn't uh, work here because it's not a Git repository. It's the same if I say Git status. So, you know, just to make this a little bit easier. For example, if I say, um, I would like to rename a file here. Let's take this file and then say, well, rename it in such a way that it's a file, but then, you know, something like uh, I want to have the current date and I have control T to have this in ISO form a format. And I write this uh, uh, like such uh, with that's uh, called globbing. So if I hit tab, you will see what this expands into, but that's just, you know, easier to remove and then manage your files and things like that. So once you get used to it, just a few commands, you can do this stuff really, really nicely here on the command line, much more efficiently than you could do in any file explorer, which is why actually you, you know, why I manage all of my files on the command line as, as crazy at this, uh, as it sounds, but it really makes you, I think, more effective once you get kind of used to that. So yeah, that's that. All right, so there's much more to be said about the command line, but just as the most helpful tips there in order to get started, I also have a video um, that I recently uh, shared on, on uh, YouTube, how to get started as a somewhat command line beginner for developers. But you know, if you're not that familiar yet, that might uh, be helpful uh, for you. But in general, what is also helpful, what that also uh, means for the command line, but in general as developers to spend more time on the keyboard which in general is helpful for developers. Why? This goes a little bit back to this, you know, uh, old fight, uh, whether you're more productive wielding your mouse or using the keyboard. And I say it depends on the type of work you mainly do. So what I actually would like to minimize is this amount of hand movements, especially if you're not that familiar with touch typing. And you know, if you would need to look down on a keyboard and say, or oh, where I'm currently located, and you know, move your hands and then move it to the mouse and, and back and all of this back and forth, is just some sort of, you know, not really a context switch, but some sort of break and some sort of friction in, in using the computer. And for example, when you're browsing a website or you uh, would do some audio or some image editing, then it's a different story because then, you know, it's more, 
you know this more exploratory way of using the mouse because you don't know up front where you end up you know it's kind of like you know in a computer game you know you have to do something to just do this exploration but if you know actually what you do or if the set of actions is kind of limited that means for example if you you know um, if you would play a song uh, on, a, on a piano then you know you have just the limited uh, uh, keys um, 88 I think and that's just easier than you know if you would uh, use a mouse or a joystick or something else just some other input um, device the same is true with typing of course it's much easier to type on a keyboard than on your phone you know it's just you will be faster at least if you're used to it and the same is true with programming because in programming at least a lot of the time we spend here you know just in the IDE now you might argue that you don't um, always uh, type code and you know you read code a lot as well yes but it also helps to just you know use some uh, some shortcuts for example to follow some uh, reference for example control uh, b to say okay what does that method do here so you, it, it will still of course you can do this with control and, and click but you will be you know faster once you get used to this actually by just using uh, your keyboard for it so i would say once the set of action is somewhat limited that you say you know you don't have infinite actions in your code and in your IDE because what you do while well, you type characters, you, made ex you might execute some things like, you know, run my code, test my code, build my project, you know, you can name them, right? But it won't be a few hundred, it will be, will be less. And with that, it just makes sense to define shortcuts or keys for these limited actions, which your IDE actually does because there's a keyboard shortcut for pretty much everything. And then to stay on this domain on you know the home row of your keyboard the home row means you place your um, fingers with f and j for your um, index fingers and stay there and don't you know like move back and forth all the time which is why i also like my linux setup here with this i use the um, i3 uh, window manager on linux which you can see it here which pre, uh, keys I'm uh, pressing. So this is not a presentation setup. This is just my the setup I use all the time with the different font size, where I can just switch back and forth using a somewhat uh, Vim-like uh, um, mapping. Why? Because then I don't have to you know move, take my mouse and you know move move it around and, and things like that. So it is just a little bit more effective to stay on this on this realm to stay on this view of using the um, keyboard and, and then just typing away rather than switching back back and forth all the time that's also why i have some um, uh, certain settings for my browser and some browser plugins where i can actually use uh, the keyboard to navigate this a little bit uh, which just helps but you know in uh, in in general um, it helps to, to stay on this on this realm of you know typing a little bit more so that's basically um, that's uh, basically that that's also the reason why for this vim editor i'm a big fan of this uh, this edit well not really the editor but the way of typing there and if you paid attention to my ide this is the same thing why i'm using this idea vim plugin so why why cursor and my line setup looks so weird here which is just for that reason so i can just do stuff without well changing my hand position right because if i type something here a few times and now if i would like to well go and navigate usually what i would have to do i would have to use the cursor arrows to move around here or god forbid the mouse right but it's actually faster to say, well, I don't want to switch these hand positions and move around. I just want to stay on the same space the whole time. And that's basically, I think, the nicest idea behind this WIM um, movement is that you have multiple what are called modes here. So you uh, default, you're in the normal mode and then you have to press a different character such as I for insert that you actually are in the insert mode where you can type and usually if you press type escape uh, if you type escape then you're back in the normal mode and you can move around so here you see which keys i'm pressing so it's basically like a computer game what you would do you know on a uh, on a first person shooter like with, uh, with this wasd and well similar movement but it's just you know you don't have to move your hands because like in a computer game you shouldn't you know, look down and switch your hand positions all the time otherwise you know you lose the game so it's just staying in this flow experience and re reducing the friction reducing the hand movements which is very very helpful 
And now what I'm doing a lot just in my setup or what I have been doing in my setup, and which is why I can navigate quite quickly here, or at least people people tell me so when we when they're watching me, um, is because I just used this this principle, this way of thinking, and applied it to as many tools or as many environments here um, as possible. So basically I say, well, look, I'm switching windows back and forth all the time, you know, like the windows that I'm working in, not the operating system. So just give me an environment where I can do this without moving my hand or altering my hand position, you know, with this alt tap or whatever, what have you. So actually this Vim movement makes a lot of sense for me. And similarly, it's the case in the editor. That's why I use my IDE with a Vim mapping. But again, I'm I use Vim a lot, but I'm not the biggest fan of Vim per se. I just really like this way of not moving the hands around. This is why I like this a lot. So that's that's one thing. And another thing goes back to for two ways. So this is a keyboard that I'm uh, using now. And I don't particularly want to do advertising for this brand. It's just one way that implements this nicely. So this is called Ultimate Hacking Keyboard. You see it's a split keyboard, but that's not the point. What the point is that you have um, a so-called uh, module, um, well, modular, I think, mod um, key, which changes the layer, which is actually very similar to this idea, um, what uh, Vim does. So let me show you this actually. I can open up this, this agent. Uh, where I have a specific setup of what it does, um, it changes the layout in such a way that now you see, so this is now not Vim, but basically the same mapping, where I can press all of these extra uh, keys, such as insert, delete, and all of it, without changing my hand position. And of course, it involves a little bit of investment, uh, of, of getting used to it, you know, of time investment. But once you get used to it, it's extremely um, nice. You know, it's you, you will be much faster. And the only reason why I haven't done this earlier was, well, before 2020, I was traveling a lot and I was using my laptop all the time. And then, you know, it's you have to switch back and forth. But now since I'm mostly uh, working from this uh, office here and I have this keyboard, and by the way, it's also quite portable. So I've traveled with the keyboard <laughs> as well before. Uh, but I just, you know, think it makes you much more, uh, much faster by using this without changing your hand position. And I can tell you, it's it's really nice to just, you know, press all of the uh, all of the keys there, especially with your IDE. Sometimes, you know, you have to press Alt Insert and things like that, um, and then you don't have to change your um, your hand position, which is just really nice. So this works uh, nicely. Also here, you know, I define some extra uh, ones for the browser switching back and forth so I can switch tabs and, you know, close tab and things like that just without uh, changing, uh, changing the hand movement, which is just another, you know, it's not about this particular keyboard. There are actually a few keyboards like that on the market, but it's again the same idea just applied that you say well i want to reduce the friction and use the computer faster and once you get used to it it's just a really nice experience so you know there are a few other keyboards like this available it's it's not about the split layout it's basically having more modifier keys and allowing the keyboard uh, to be programmed basically so what you do here it actually changes then the firmware once you change so this works really well really nicely uh, then you can just plug it in into a different computer and it literally sends this keystroke once you hit that key. So that's just um, really nice. I actually recently also, maybe I should make a, make a video about this as well. I purchased these extra modules so now I can use, you know, my my mouse here without switching my hand position. Um, well, I don't know if that's, uh, that's the best um, idea, but uh, this is just really helpful there. So that's that's that on, you know, the keyboard. So again, depends um, a little bit what you're doing, but just spending um, time there as a developer helps a lot. And, you know, just thinking about that approach of uh, saying, well, can I reduce the friction here? Okay, let's so have a look at the chat. I have a question for a Git command line. Git gives a lot of nice suggestions, but for using them, I always use a mouse for using them on the command line. I want to use the keyboard mouse with... Uh, without typing the whole command do you know a way uh example creating the local branch and try to commission to uh to push it to a remote it tells me uh this long command that i want uh to use yes depends if it's i'm not 100 percent sure about the example but if it's one command um for a question in the chat that you can type in a single command then i would use an alias 
but if it's something that needs um, multiple commands then I just would use a shell script I, I'll show you two examples maybe that makes it more clear I actually have a very similar example if if I understand you correctly so the question is let's go to some well I don't have to go to repository it doesn't matter um, for example if I say I would like to have git status and you know a simple command or git commit that should be quite clear but what if I say, well, I would like to have a push. Okay, that's also easy. But then a combination, for example, uh, what I often do is push, uh, pull, push. So, you know, pull it first with a rebase just to make sure you have the latest version and then push. I often do this by doing a commit and then do a pull, rebase, push. So, you know, the rebase would fail if it would fail, but then I know, okay, I have the latest one in this current branch and then push. So this is kind of like the maximum. It's a lot of characters, but uh, for example, for me, let's show it slowly, uh, that's the alias for it. And then it does it, you know, one after another. If it gets a little bit too complex or too, you know, cryptic what, uh, what you see here, then what you can do, and this is actually what my git graph does, um, it's actually an, an, an alias that goes for git minus something. That's a git feature if you have um, any um, well, script or executable provided that set, that is called git minus something, it will actually be it will be taken automatically as a subcommand. So if I define git minus uh, git dash, uh, dash graph, this is actually um, let me show this. This the, uh, this is a script that I have that does a quite long line of you know this ASCII art um, explorer of my git commits. So with this, I don't want to see all of that, you know, ugly code all the time. So I said, okay, I put this into um, a script. I name it for git specifically git minus. So that's a git feature why this works. Git minus something and then the something will be a git subcommand. So now I can type git graph and internally it will take git minus. I have the same with uh, git update. So update is not usually a, uh, a feature, but I can say um, git update is a script that I have what it does it basically say well you know add everything uh, commit everything with you know a default message I do this especially with some config um, repositories where it's not really code but that I just use for myself where I don't care about the message or I could provide one and then pull a rebase and push so basically you have some changes update all of them like you know throw everything into the repository and then you can have this as a subcommand that will be taken automatically you don't have to configure anything you just you know have such a, a script in your uh, path and then it will take this and you know just um, do that it's like what does the branch so oh yeah you go to the you go to the um, root directory of the git repository so if you're somewhere in a sub repository a sub directory you go up you add everything in the whole you know repo you commit, pull, uh, pull, push, and you know, go back, basically. So I hope that um, does it there. Okay, I use the mouse. Oh, yeah, I use the mouse for copy and paste. Uh, paste. Oh, yeah, that's another thing. Uh, just one um, tip on that. You can use. There are some um, uh, features for that depending on your OS. So. Uh, for example, uh, clip copy is one, or I think X clip or something like this, where I say um, echo hello. There are multiple ways what you would like to have. If I say control O, I define this also as a shortcut to basically uh, copy and paste uh, or copy the whole command. Hello, this is a long command. Control O, and then I can copy this or you say you would like to copy the output so for example if I say have this and then pipe it into that then you have the output here so for example to your point because you just uh, said you need to use the mouse sometimes you could uh, just say okay I have this output and it's just faster because then I don't have to touch the mouse if I have this and say you know there's another shell alias actually to just copy this real quick and then I have it copied there so that's that's that so I also, um, I think I have some shortcuts here from my command line, you know, a leader, a leader key P or something like this for paste and uh, paste in yank. So similar to, to Vim, where you just have this. So very good point in the question in the chat, copy and paste should also be possible using the, co um, the keyboard without touching your mouse. 
All right. Um, I'm not a big fan of the Linux interface like GNOME or KDE. Neither am I. GNOME was actually the reason why I moved away from Ubuntu a long, long time ago. But never use i3 Window Manager or Sway. It's, it's, it's easy to configure the setup. I'm also using Arch. To answer your question, if you use Arch, then yes, because then you're used to a lot of Linux pain and I feel you, so it's okay. <laughs> um, once somebody told me, uh, you know, Arch Linux, which is what I'm using, is um, an OS by computer science students for computer science students. And there's certainly some truth to this. So if you're, you know, used to it, if you can handle it well, well then you will be, I think, quite happy with the i3 window manager. Um, it's... I would say somewhat straightforward. In the beginning, you might have some weird artifacts, for example, you know, some some windows that might be a, a floating loading uh, window in the middle, then might be full screen or something like that. But you can you can change that as well. Um, but I'm actually quite happy with the just default behavior. So definitely give it a go. Yeah, I would I would say so. Okay, some more things. Hello, can you share your IdeaVim or Vim config? What do you think about NeoVim LSP plugins as IDE? Yes, I can share that. I will share this in the end as well. It's basically my Sebastian Dashner dot files um, repository. And um, the end, I will also point you to some links. So all of my, you know, productivity content on my blog and th things like that will point you to some, you know, helpful, helpful tips and pointers. Um, this is particularly about my idea of Vim and Vim uh, setup. So just Dashner dot files and you can uh, check it out there. Um, what I think about NeoVim and some plugins as IDE. Well, as fully fleshed IDE, I know that some people, you know, uh, have a setup that just uses Vim to do this basically. For me, it's just not powerful enough or I don't really see the point. Um, sometimes, so what, what I have, what you see, I have um, IdeaVim as an IntelliJ plugin and all of the IDEs have some, you know, plugin for Vim um, movement which is in some corner cases not quite as powerful as using Vim or NeoVim. With some syntax doesn't work, you know, some stuff collides with the other IDE features. But for me, it's definitely good enough and it outweighs the benefit, just the fact that I have a fully fledged IDE, especially IntelliJ is just extremely powerful. And for me, you know, you might get close to it by using some plugins and some stuff yeah, with Vim or some other plain text editor. But it's just for me not worth it and it won't be, you know, as good because even if there's, as a, at, le at least that's my opinion, because even if there's some plugin and some person, you know, puts in a lot of effort, but comparing to IntelliJ where you have, you know, a whole company doing nothing else, basically, um, I, I just see this is much more powerful. It depends which features you, uh, you want and certainly, you know, I'm pretty sure somebody can set up a... Uh, a setup uh, that you can be happy with but i think you just spend so much more time rather than doing something you know uh, productive at least that's my assumption so i wouldn't advise you to but if you have a setup or if you're building one and you're happy with then you know go for it certainly what i actually do sometimes when i have some features or something that is actually faster to be done in a vim editor then i just go you know, I basically use this i3 window manager features to quickly switch the win windows back and forth and say, okay, then just, uh, you know, take my code and copy and paste it into Vim and do something with it and, and, and paste it back. Or I actually do this quite often if I say I want to have some invocations with some extra features where I think not all of them might be available in Vim. For example, where I say I uh, have some hello world and all of that would be uh, possible in IDEs as well, but just for the sake of the example, right? So I have a lot of lines of code here, and then I say, well, use a feature such as um, norm beginning, um, for example, call a method, for example, system out print line like this. Do the same thing with that, and then take this and copy and paste my no, lost somewhere copy and paste this here into my uh, code. So I do quite often things like that where I just combine it a little bit. But to answer your question, I wouldn't go as far that I, you know, trying to make a whole IDE out of my uh, Vim experience, uh, to be honest. Okay, uh, a little bit off topic questions. For me, the Op Liberty Maven plugin boosted my productivity for Jakarta EE development. Yes, I fully agree uh, with that. I also will show a little bit of, of that stuff in a second. Um, 
So basically what the question is, that is a development mode plugin that just makes the turnaround or waiting times uh, shorter. Yeah, we will come to this in a second as well. All right, so if you have more questions, feel free to ask them. And pretty much to the point of the question in the chat, like don't wait. That is another very important uh, point for, well, it's not just productivity. So this is not one of this, you know, you have to be more productive and use your time more efficiently. No, it is more about, you know, the term, the flow experience. So basically being in the flow, like, you know, being fully committed and fully focused on what you're doing, you know, you're blending out all of the other experiences. You're not really checking uh, the time or, you know, anything else around you. And you're just fully, you know, immersed in the task, which is a great feeling that we hopefully all know as developers. And of course, there are certain things that just make you wait, right? Like, you know, you know you're writing your code and then you're executing some tests or you want to start up your application or you need to compile or, you know, the typical excuses. And then, of course, what happens while well, we're human beings, we get distracted. And the waiting time, it's really, you know, with the human attention span, this gets shorter and shorter, but it's just a few seconds, literally, until you actually get bored and want to do something else. So if your bill takes 20 seconds, like this is too long. And it's not too long because of the 20 seconds of time being wasted, but because, you know, you execute your, uh, your build, you do something here. And then you say, okay, executed it, I executed it. And then of course, you know, I pull out my phone and I check my phone and I look at Twitter and I haven't checked my email in a while. And you know, you see the email from the boss and then you're like, oh, what did they uh, just write? What should I answer to it? And your attention goes somewhere and you don't even notice that your task has been finished in the meanwhile, because it just took too long. So that's a very important point to say, well, I actually don't want to make you wait. So we have to set up or build up a environment in which we're just, you know, really productive in. So for example, I have Quarkus project here. So this is just one example, but only for the sake of the example, there are many technologies that support this, but Quarkus I think is one of the, the best ones or nicest ones out there in the chat was also mentioned. Uh, Open Liberty has a similar thing. What it does, it supports actually out of the box. So Quarkus is a um, enterprise Java framework, but again, it's not about even Java here. Um, that supports a nice uh, feature for a so-called development mode that you can start up with a Quarkus Maven plugin. And then what it does, it just you know allows you to run stuff uh, real quick. So for example, if I would go and say, let's open this up in my IDE. And by the way, you see I created another script to start my IDE because I have to do this all the time. And if I would now go and say, well, for example, um, what is a nice resource here? I have this application now running and I have something that just says, hello, it's, you know, like a hello world on, on HTTP uh, that says coffee dot, uh, which is a code that comes from here. And the point is, well, what it does, it actually has a connection to the code and it runs your application in a mode where I can very quickly uh, just restart. Oh, there we go. Coffee. Um, oh, I have some other problems in my code. I just wanted to show you this example. Uh, there we go. Or is it? I think I had to probably clean my project before. Okay, that's my bad. I wasn't fully prepared uh, to show this. Okay. Test fail, yes, because I changed now my code. There we go. That's that's what you get. Um, but basically what I want to show is just a way to set up a project. It doesn't matter if it's Java or any other project, especially for front-end development, this works really nicely, um, where you say you want to run in some sort of development mode where you actually don't need to wait. And I mean, not even wait two, three, three four, five seconds. That might even get uh, be uh, too long because then you get distracted. So again, my application is running here. And if I want to change something, I just say, well, change the code, hit save, and then, you know, your code will be changed here. And what it does, it very quickly reloads uh, your application because of this, well, development mode. So it doesn't run quite in a production mode, but just in the development mode um, that works really nicely because it's so fast. What it does, it uses some, you know, uh, under the hood uh, measures, some 
um, pre-compilation and some black uh, black magic to just swap out your classes and to quickly restart your application it does the same with tests so they are pre-compiled and if I want to run my tests which now fails because of um, my code that I changed it works really fast so this is something that I really uh, like now I'm blocking the view on this so see it runs literally in a few milliseconds and you hear my keystrokes so it runs you know real quick let's do the test output here and then what I can do I just well either change uh, my code of course or change uh, the test let's go there let's say assert that it equals to coffee exclamation mark and I didn't, you know, I couldn't even <laughs> have a chance to switch back that quickly. It was just very quickly rerunning my test because it detected a change and it's already there. So I, I don't even have to a, a chance to, you know, wait. Uh, same is true. Sometimes it's not as fast, but same is true if I run the whole stuff in my IDE. So you heard the keystroke and now, you know, pretty quickly, I just see the results. So, you know, I don't even have the time to pull out my phone. I see now, you know, the test is, is like this. And in general, just make sure you build yourself up a, a setup where you don't have to wait. It also works with front-end development, works with now most modern technologies where you say you can run this at least in some mode, it might not be the production mode, but some local development type of mode um, where you don't have to wait. Uh, works also with Spring. There's a Spring Dev Tool, uh, Dev Tools or something uh, I think it's called. Uh, with Quarkus, it works really nicely. It comes out of the box. Also, this whole development mode has a nice experience here. You can say, well, please quickly rerun this. It has a terminal injector where you can just restart your application as well, real quick. So that's just I think pretty cool. But in general, build yourself up a setup where you don't have to wait. The same is true from some uh, for so, some sort of system tests or application tests where you say I have my application similar to that running in some fashion here locally and I want to use um, you know a test that also tests the endpoint of my application you know like a more real world test not just you know code level unit test they're always pretty fast but something where I can access the application real quickly. And this is a really important point, not just in Quarkus land, but also uh, uh, for Spring Boot, because there's these, you know, context tests that always take a while until they start up the application. And, you know, there's that's a whole long story on its own. But basically, you want to build it up in such a way where you can say, well, how can I um, start this up a little bit um, easier? So, for example, I have my system test environment here where I have a system test that I can just uh, start up and it actually goes against my application. So it goes there and say I think I have to use this Maven integration test then it says okay you know go against uh, this um, HTTP API actually so this is that directory um, this one so it actually connects to my application with local host and then you know checks for that output and of course now it fails because well I changed uh, it here so let's uh, adapt this to coffee exclamation mark as well and I can just quickly rerun my test either in a command line here using maven or of course in the IDE and say please just uh, rerun this here so the point is what I want to show you whatever you do whether you change production code or test code or want to just quickly re-execute something build yourself up an environment in which you can do this really quickly without waiting so you see you know i cannot even talk as as fast if i uh, change the test here then you know i rerun it and now the test fails then i can change my uh, production code again now i rerun uh, this as well and now under the hood it will restart the application so my test is green again and so on and so forth and now the other test is uh uh, fails again because um, now of this error and so on and so forth. So you see, don't wait. So don't uh, make me wait uh, for that setup because I just you know want to stay in the flow experience without waiting for any other you know output. So with this local development environment, it can be very pragmatic. You know, you can use some sort of shell scripting and duct tape and all of that stuff to build it up. For me, I think that's fine. You know, it might not end up in your um, CICD pipeline, you might have a different process for that. That's okay, because it saves me time while I'm doing my local development. And that is the case most of the time, right? So, you know, not always, you know, pushing to a CICD environment, then you wait, and then your colleague sees all of, you know, your code and failed builds that didn't work. 
but instead try this out locally also with some you know system test perspective docker containers for example help a lot or you know minikube kubernetes cluster or whatever have you and then um once you know once you know that it works quite surely you can then go and uh, and push but you stay in this uh, development uh, flow experience while you develop locally so that's just uh, really helpful there okay so um some questions um in the chat what's your opinion on spring boot versus jakarta ee well that's a, a quite uh, quite long story there actually you know uh, in some of my projects, I, I did use uh, Spring Boot, and sometimes um, my my clients ask me for that as well. I mostly, you know, prefer well. I would say Jakarta EE for the APIs, especially CDI. I find a little bit more powerful for dependency injection, and I just like these uh, APIs. I'm also a little bit biased because I helped uh, uh, standardizing uh, one or two of them, like in JaxRS in the past, uh, but. I like these APIs a lot, but especially nowadays, I focus quite a bit on Quarkus, which has a really nice um, experience, especially for the development experience, uh, which is not really, well, a little bit connected to this topic here, but it's a Java top topic here. Um, why? Because you see this is integrated really nicely. And for most modern uh, projects and client projects that I'm doing now, I'm actually at least pointing uh, folks to this technology, Quarkus, uh, which I think it's just, you know, a little bit uh, more effective to use. But of course, you know, Spring is a very nice solution. And, you know, if people are happy with it, if, if it's a nice solution to implement your enterprise project, then go for it. Especially, you know, these sort of uh, wars, I would say, are a little bit over because for at least 95 or 99 percent of the enterprise applications, both or all of you know uh, Quarkus or specifically um, or Jakarta EE and MicroProfile in general or Spring are totally fine because they have all of the features and you know development experience and nice coding experience to to do so and you even see this in some migration projects where people can quite quickly you know swap annotations and the concepts are the same and you can just you know reuse your code uh, even in, in some sort because it's pretty much you know similar for this declarative api programming model which i think is is quite nice for both uh, technologies all right so that uh, quick off-topic question about the java world so a few more things and a few more tips on how to become more effective as a developer and one thing is to manage distractions and i mean this managed in a somewhat literal sense because you know, there are a lot of um, things that can distract us in our our life. And most of these distractions don't just go away by themselves. We actually have to pretty much manage them deliberately, especially, first of all, your work environment. This is why I actually like this Linux environment that I uh, use so much, because especially this Arch Linux that we had in the chat before, it's so nice because if you install it, it does nothing. Like literally, if you install your um, brand new Arch Linux system, it, it pretty much um, looks like this. So, you know, you have a flashing command prompt. You don't have any UI. You have nothing. If you want to have something, you have to install it. That's a question of taste, but I like it a lot. Why? Because the computer does exactly, mostly, hopefully, what I tell it to do, right? And nothing else just by, its, uh, by itself. So, you know, if I want to work right now, it doesn't tell me, hey, by the way, you have a Windows update, you know, and there's nothing potentially that you uh, could do that is more important than this Windows update right now, and you should do it. And I'm like, no, don't go on my nerves. Don't even show me this notification. I don't want to have anything especially sometimes when I have to use Windows and then I see this, you know, you open up the start menu and you have the current weather and the current news and some nice picture. And I'm like, just leave me alone. Let me do my work. I want to focus, you know, so don't even do that. Um, that's why I like such a setup where you don't have anything per default. And if you want to have it, you deliberately add it. Or if not, then you have to actually shut them down. So that's why I say manage distractions, especially your phone. So what I do, you know, in the beginning, I try to turn off all of the notifications, things like that. It's just a, you know, fight against uh, windmills. So now what I do with my phone, I just keep it on silent and on flight mode while I'm working. I'm not kidding. So especially during the night, my, my phone is on flight mode uh, because it's great. Then you won't get anything. And it's just really nice because you also it doesn't distract you. And similarly, all of these notifications that come in Slack, email, just close it. 
just close all of these um, applications. Don't use them while you're working. Well, of course, sometimes you, you need to, but then I would deliberately have some messaging channels such as, you know, one team chat that only you open that and you don't see all of the other messages or, you know, whatever a tool you're using, but literally to not, you know, get distracted out of the box. So you really have to um, manage these sort of things to limit them. Um, I also sometimes say limit your communication channels that, that you only see what you actually want to see right now for your work and everything else should just be closed. The nice side effect of it is your computer becomes more performant if you close on Slack and all of these other stuff, you just don't need it. And again, that's what I like about my uh, Linux setup. It just does what I, mostly what I tell it to do uh, and nothing else. For your phone, you know, put this away. There's even some psychology, some science behind it that if you put your phone on your table, that it will, you know, distract you. It will lower your mental energy, even if it's turned off. So there's something about the, you know, fear of missing out there going on as well. So just put it away. For me, it's always in my backpack or somewhere uh, where I actually don't see it when I'm walking around where it's just really a clean environment. I don't have any, you know, distractions there. And then for your work environment, this really depends on, you know, the environment and your settings. So, you know, if you uh, work from home and have some uh, kids or a spouse or whoever uh, running around or you have your own office or you have coworkers or, you know, all of that stuff. But mostly you can manage that somewhat as well. So either by, you know, talking to people and telling them, hey, you know what, uh, this and this, uh, these and these are my working hours. Um, which I really don't want to uh, be distracted uh, too much. Or when you say, okay, your team, you know, needs to have an update from you that you say you can disappear for like, you know, 30 minutes and get back within that time so that you're not just unresponsive, you know, to say, oh, by the way, you know, I won't respond to your messages and buy and close my emails. No, but that you say, okay, set yourself a timer for 60 minutes or, you know, two hours. And in these two hours, you can fully focus and then, you know, that time or whatever will then just wake you up and tell you, okay, now please quickly check your messages. If there's something super urgent, then close it again and then continue. And this just, you know, really helps once you think about it to say, okay, what is actually stealing my focus? What is derailing me? What is, you know, stealing my attention? And then try to deliberately manage that because otherwise it just won't uh, go away uh, by itself. That is a topic that highly depends on your situation. Again, you know, whether you uh, live alone or not or where you're working and all of it, but always there is some sort of remedy. There's some sort of way of talking to people or, you know, like, or using earplugs or noise canceling headphones on all of this stuff where you can just, um, what works for you and where it can disappear in order to manage distractions and, you know, to focus better on what you would like to uh, focus on. So that's uh, something. All right. So if you have any questions on that topic, then, you know, uh, feel uh, free to ask there as well. And another thing that makes you definitely more effective as a developer is to, you know, learn and to keep learning, especially once we, you know, grow and become more experienced. Um, you know, just trying to stay humble and don't assume you know uh, everything because, well, IT is such a broad and deep topic. Uh, well, chances are you don't. And just keep learning every single every single day, you know, in every new project, which is what I love a lot about uh, my work um, as a consultant because I, you know, uh, learn a lot in every single new project, even if I've done and uh, used the technology a lot, you always have something, some aspect that is new, you know, some new technology um, and things like that that comes along, but also keep learning and le relearning the basics, you know, because the basics of IT, you know, how computers work, like, you know, computer architecture, you know, this von Neumann and how it is built up with CPUs and RAM, uh, disk, uh, all of that stuff, um, especially, um, or as well as, you know, internet architecture, you know, how transactions work and all of these things that is quite timeless knowledge and you know once you see some new technologies you can adapt and you know transfer some knowledge uh, there as well so this is really really helpful and you know just be trying to be curious and keep learning as a developer it definitely makes you uh, more effective there and in the same way trying to share some knowledge with others 
and not just because of uh, you should be a nice person and you know share with others what you learn but also it will make you yet again more effective and it will deepen your knowledge because before you know you write a blog post or share something or you know have an internal um, small presentation in your company or you know want, want to give a talk or you know have a YouTube channel or whatever you will double and triple check your knowledge just that you know okay is it actually true and you know you will find new things that make you go uh, deeper down the rabbit hole in order to just you know get get more effective in order to to just know more and once you share that knowledge that definitely helps you the most so it helps you as well and also it helps your future self which is quite funny because if you write uh, some documentation it's not just that you're nice for your colleagues no also in a few weeks from now you will have no clue what you did and why so writing a documentation just for yourself and writing some some sort of notes uh, help you a lot as well so this is something that is really um, you know helpful uh, to do as well and sharing knowledge you know in all sort of forms so it can be just some documentation it can be a company internal presentation it can be an actual presentation on a uh, on a conference it can be a podcast a youtube channel a blog like open source software you know whatever um, you do it helps you to become more effective and you know i can really just uh, encourage uh, you to do so so let me check do we have some uh, more questions on that as well. One question in the chat. What about project settings? Assume you commit for a project for six months. After a month or earlier, you notice that the project is toxic, over hours, political deadla uh, that deadlines, uh, agile is not working, etc. Well, you know, I can say so if it's well, always depends on your, you know, the actual uh, project. There is certainly some control that you have if you say, you know, how, how one uh, behaves. But if it's too political and everything, I mean, the, one of the, um, the powers that we have as a developer, that especially now developers are highly in demand. So I would, well, first of all, have, you know, would, would try to have an honest conversation with just your, uh, your managers and, and see, okay, is this something that can be worked out? Like what is ex uh, especially the issue, you know, with regards to over hours or that you say, okay, is this just managed poorly that people are stressed out and, you know, deadlines cannot be uh, taken because somebody did wrong estimations or just, you know, didn't take uh, in the time for quality, for automation, for writing tests, for refactoring and things like this, this is very often the issue. And how can we tackle it? So I would um, very much distinguish between is there something sensible that, that we can do if it's just like mismanaged um, in order to improve the situation. And I understand that because I mostly worked as a self-employed person uh, that you, if you're employed, this is a harder you know, topic because you, you have to be somewhat brave to, uh, to, to, speak this, uh, to speak up. But it's very much, um, you know, I would say, um, very much the right thing to do to just speak up to your managers and say hey this doesn't work for these and these reasons and not just to say yeah i think this feels bad no but with actual numbers or with actual reasons like hey say hey this does not work because of x like people are overworked this is a bad way to manage the project we don't have enough um proper tests we don't have enough you know um automation we didn't invest enough into refactoring this is why the velocity goes down or something like this where you can actually do something about it and then trying to communicate it if then still, you know, uh, it lands on, on deaf ears and, you know, you, there is no change, then you can still say, okay, maybe I want to look for a new job or whatever. And especially if it's a toxic environment where it's about, you know, behavior, where people just are uh, somewhat, you know, behaving in an awful way, where you say, okay, it doesn't, it's not fun to work here or with some other uh, teammates where it's, you know, not the best environment, you might consider that as well. But I always would say, you know, trying to distinguish that because in many um, situations you actually have quite a bit of control if you're just um, communicating openly and communi you know just you know be brave enough to step up and say hey look this is really a problem it doesn't work for these and these reasons and then see uh, what you can do there and maybe um, improve the situation there so um, I would I would say so all right in the chat youtube's algorithm was made to distract us yes as well as any social media this is so true that's why i added the videos to the watch later list yes i do the same i even have some sites like twitter where i actively um blend out so there are some um uh, there are some browser plugins available where i can actually hide the timeline which is really helpful as well i know this also exists for youtube i sometimes like 
to you know browse that around it's like a, a guilty pleasure when i take some some break for me uh, browsing youtube but i fully agree so if that's if you see that you get drawn into into that too much you might even want to consider you know deleting the app or using some sort of filter where you don't see that and then only deliberately add it to you know watch later playlist or something and then only search for that or only browse that um this helps yes certainly and i i feel you <laughs> all right in the chat the customer is not really able to improve the situation uh uh, do you do a quick exit or do you have a better idea? I think it's a matter of be, uh, being healthy. Yes. So ultimately, you know, it's it's very, very individual. You know, a question again in the, in the chat about this. What, uh, what, what the best solution is? Like, you know, it's so individual and you have to look at the situation of, of ac asking yourself, first of all, is there a reasonable way to improve that? Also, of course, not just, the, you know, a manager and team, but also the customer and what their expectations are. But also chances are that nobody communicated with the customer why certain things are important, right? Like, for example, spending time on... Um, uh, on improving tests and refactoring and all of these things. And sometimes, you know, people just don't understand, especially if they don't have a technical background. So not ever is, uh, not, not always is this malevolent. It's just like, might be just, okay, they don't know better. But you also mentioned a point, like a matter of being healthy. Yeah, this is also something like, you know, there's a term like choose choose your battle. And sometimes it might just not be worth it to have like, you know, to be super stressed out about it, to have burnout, to have sleepless nights when you really don't feel well in that working environment where you say, okay, is it really worth putting this amount of effort or amount of stress in? Because it's always some sort of effort or mental, you know, effort that you do in order to improve a situation. And if you feel, okay, it's not worth my, you know, mental health or my well-being and I would be way better off in a different environment, you know, then that's also certainly important to consider because i believe that you know work should be something that we really enjoy and we should look forward to any work day where we can go in the office i don't know at least that's my my assumption because being a developer is such an amazing job and if that's not the case then you might consider that as well so that's all what i um what i can say uh for that and yeah maybe maybe that helps uh frank yes greetings back thank you and yeah, if you have some more questions, just put them into uh, the chat. So that's something there. And also what I definitely can recommend uh, to have a look at is to somewhat, you know, own your time. And also, again, heavily depends on how you work uh, and, you know, in which project and situation. But basically what it means, somewhat be aware of like the time and how and when you work and when you're the most productive. So first of all, understand and mostly, you know, developers have a pretty good understanding of that, that you say, if you have a bigger chunks of time that is available, you will be more focused work, as opposed to, you know, you have five minutes here and then an interruption and a half an hour there and then a meeting and you know, another half an hour, you know, this is not a nice day, rather than if you have a few hours of uninterrupted chunks of time where you can actually focus and do something. So that's one thing to just keep in your mind. But the other thing is also when are you the most productive? And quite typical for developers, this is either like early in the morning or late at night or, you know, in some quiet times or where you can just focus well. Or for a lot of people, this is actually just after waking up when your mind is not occupied with all of the stuff of the of the whole day yet. And what I'm saying, try to somewhat identify this for yourself, how you work well. Heavily depends on your environment as well, right? Whether you're working from home or not, or maybe you want to combine this a little bit, say you wake up early and then from home where it's really quiet, you can work one or two hours doing something or, you know, writing on something and then go to the office or vice versa and things like that. And um, just see what works for you and trying to optimize a little bit for that. And also this own your time perspective is really, you know, be a little bit, how should I say, harsh about it. Like, you know, also tell your people your, your boundaries and say, you know, try to protect these uh, times in which you can focus really well. Why? And not just of, you know, being selfish and saying, hey, I want to work because it really feels good to work nicely in the morning and not be in the stupid meeting. No, but also from a perspective that you can really um, say this in a reasonable way that this is the best use of your time, especially in that, you know, high productivity uh, time or high productivity working hours. So, for example, if um, your boss comes and say, well, you have to attend this meeting there, then you say, hey, look, 
I can, yes, but it will just destroy, you know, most of my highly productive time in the morning. And this is where I get uh, a lot done usually. Is it really important um, that I, you know, attend this particular meeting or can we do it in the afternoon where I'm, you know, more relaxed, where I don't mind attending meeting or not so much rather than in, you know, as opposed to in my high productivity time, which is what I uh, do when I'm in project, at least mostly, well, depends on the project. Where I say, well, I usually don't take meetings actually in the uh, before lunch or something, which works actually quite well with my time zone uh, based in Europe here. When I work with Americans, that's somewhat the uh, the default out of the box because they're still asleep uh, then. But you know that that's just what what works for me. Where I say this is my high productivity time, and I really somewhat fight for having that time for myself, and I won't be available. And it goes as far that I say, well, I don't take my phone off the flight mode until then, and I don't take my email so you know unless the police opens up my door like nobody will, will get me there and i'm just here focusing on on that work but that's a little bit extreme example for for my type of work but trying to just be you know a little bit more well reasonable about like how you spend the time and what is actually a high productivity time for you and then trying to you know sort or sort out your calendar as such you can also have some hacks like for example actually block time in your calendar so this is what i also highly would recommend that you say you know not just have a task list there uh, but basically assign the task um, um, for a particular you know either in your calendar so i also have well i actually created a, a, a tool for that um, and that is available online as well. It's called Day Captain, uh, where I combine a task list with, so that's basically what I use every day, um, a task list with a calendar. And I say, okay, drag this, you know, literally into the calendar, block out some time for two or three hours, and then I'm literally busy. So I literally do this then. And this also works, you know, pretty well actually in a corporate environment where you say, okay, I'm just, you know, busy at that time. You cannot book a meeting because this is now um, this important time where I hack. And I wouldn't feel bad about this, quite the opposite. If you think about this, you know, what you're also being paid and what is the high value of your work is actually that time when you can focus well. And you should actually prioritize this more of scheduling such a time in your calendar as you would schedule in, instead a meeting, right? Because chances are, I mean, some meetings are really um, effective as well and important and all of that, yes. But just trying to see, okay, does it really make sense to have this here in the middle of my high productivity time where I know I will be distracted before and afterwards because of the you know preparation and then until I get fully up to speed again, it really blows a big hole into this time block or can I do it in a different time or maybe in one day where I only have meetings and the rest of the week is free or something like that. So depends on you know what you can do there, but just the notation that you be reasonable and um, you know think a little bit more um, about that is just really helpful there okay let's see do we have some questions about this in the chat i will just uh, quickly post this tool don't want to in, in the chat uh, what i just mentioned i don't want to too much uh, here uh, take too much time here in this session but then you can check this out as well Okay, some questions. What do you think about microservice architecture and what about plain, uh, plain old monolith architecture? Sorry for off topic. Um, yeah, no worries, that's fine. Um, about architecture, yes, with microservice, that's a, uh, since a few years, uh, pretty much of a, bu a buzzword. Uh, I would say highly depends what the requirements are, like why would you actually care about you know this type of architecture? Uh, plain old monolith applications, my, so what I think about it, what I would start off with in almost all the project is actually, you know, you can call it monolith, uh, but a single, you know, deployment uh, for an application or a single package for an application, unless you have a different reason to do so. So, you know, if you say you would like to split up something, well, there needs to be a reason. Either it's developed by a different team and it has a different deployment or development cycle, or you have to deploy it individually and, you know, independently from each other for some reason, or, you know, there is a different reason why it might not make sense to actually put it together. So this is usually I start up with a start off with something that is, you know, monolithic architecture, place it into, you know, one single package of a one single application have it maybe in different packages for different modules like i usually like to slice it virtually uh, vertically and then start from there and then if you need to slice it up then you know your vertical packages are a very good way to get started um but it's also very pragmatic and then you know you already have this 
um, sort of separations that that work well there. So um, this question is a little bit generic, but that's basically my thoughts of especially what I would start off with in a project to say, okay, you know, start off in a very uh, pragmatic way. Okay, some more. I think the neighbor is now making some noise. I hope you don't hear this too much. Uh, talking about distractions. Um, more questions. How do you keep your notes organized? My current solution is I write every notes in one file and separate them with um, dash dash. If I need to find something, use control search for keywords. Yes, this I think this is actually a very good approach. I have a few uh, files like this as well. Uh, what I do, I have a few structures. Um, for example, I have a directory. You see, I also can do this with a uh, shortcut as well an alias uh, with a clipboard where I just say you know can have something like my project and then I um, usually I use ASCII doc formats but it doesn't really matter um, where I have a structure where this then uh, just gets uh, stored in some directory and then I have kind of like project based or topic based files but usually then also in the command line I use you know some uh, find or and, uh, grab command to z just search some directory. It's a little bit similar um, to what you're doing but just on a um, command line for the plain reason that reading for me then is a little bit easier if I open up the file and it's not huge but kind of like separated. So uh, if it works out for you I would, uh, um, I would have like a single folder and then a bunch of files that are you know uh, separated by topic or by project or whatever have you. I have a little bit more than that. I have some folder structure where I say something about, you know, like IT and then, you know, like some uh, some private stuff uh, might be, you know, some other private projects where I then have a folder per, um, you know, some sort of areas that are just a little bit uh, bigger. But that's just a question of I would start with a very basic hierarchy and then kind of, you know, kind of like with refactoring, start with one class if it gets to or one method if it gets to complex, like, you know, use delegation, sort of like this, and then introduce some folders and, you know, have it very basic, like, you know, fully agree with you, like have a, a plain text editor that you're happy with and then use uh, find and grab and whatever. I also use one uh, feature of um, that's it. Um, it's called, uh, I think, not clipboard, what's a scratch pad. That's, uh, that's it. So I can use, I think it's uh, my super key and minus or something like that to blend this in and out. Um, usually I don't like these floating windows in my uh, tiling window manager, but that's one exception where I say I do something here, I quickly want to blend this in, uh, take some notes and then blend it out for just one, you know, and it's kind of like a, you know, post-it note that you pull up and back or of course uh, you do this in a separate window. So that's one i3 window manager feature. I think it's called scratch pad um, that I'm using to just you know have this uh, back and forth. Um, that's pretty much it. Uh, otherwise really just you know into files and folders and then using also searching. So I fully agree with you uh, on that. I mostly use the ASCII doc format, but that's also just a question of taste, you know, markdown or something. But for me, um, is also fine, but for me, a plain text of file is important because then it's just easier to handle rather than any other, you know, uh, what you see is what you get uh, from it. Something like this. Okay. Um, what book or where are we here? What books or materials could you recommend for researching system design besides this? Because um, Chris, this your solution of C10M problem from you. Um, C10M problem concurrency. So, what's the problem with these acronyms? There are too many of that. Actually, uh, 10 million simultaneous connections. Yes. Um, that's someone did. Okay. Um, or you're talking about this bus, but I don't think so. <laughs> Yes. So uh, first of all, researching system design, um, system design, but design in general, I would say domain driven design is, uh, is still a very nice one uh, for that as well. Um, if you're more interested into the, the, to the scaling and concurrency issue of system, well, I mostly see this actually from, you know, this design architectural uh, perspective, uh, domain driven design something like this. Um, that's a book that I can highly recommend actually to any, uh, you know, developer who do something with um, uh, object orientation. 
Uh, so this is uh, this is definitely helpful there. So for you know basically the architectural part. Uh, then if you're talking more about um, uh, well basically concurrency transactions uh, things like that. Uh, there was a book that I uh, Chris Richardson. Um, job uh, microservice patterns. This was the one um, that I liked. Especially, it uh, talks about you know like um, the um, aspect of uh, second here uh, the aspect of um, a, a concurrency and then you know transactions and all of this in uh, distributed systems. So um, how to do uh, this and you know talking about CQRS and a few other uh, patterns. Um, which is uh, quite interesting, quite helpful. Um, maybe that's that's one. There's also a similar book about uh, databases, but it depends a little bit on which uh, particular uh, sphere you're interested in. So about um, C2M, uh, maybe using Java virtual threads. Yes, that's probably one uh, solution. So basically about a problem like how to handle like many, many uh, connections there. I would say that's uh, that's one. So if you if you're talking about scaling up, like scaling up a system virtually, uh, then this might be a solution. That basically, Java looms, you know, virtual threads um, that you can start up uh, many many of these. It's a question how far you actually can go there with a uh, with a performant machine. Um, other than that, you have to look into patterns like that. Is to say, okay, how can I horizontally scale and you know scale up up until you can have a look at uh, this Google Spanner uh, database uh, that uses all of these tricks uh, up until a global um, a, a scale uh, where you say, how can uh, you handle a really, really big uh, workload? But so that might be interesting things, but I would see this more from a, you know, kind of like scientific perspective almost because uh, really most projects that uh, that say they need to scale um, as much like, you no know, chances are you're not, uh, you know, Google or Amazon or something like that. So um that is probably something you know to consider um as well okay so i hope this ans uh, answers your question a little bit um where do i find good resources how to uh, write advanced shell scripts like how to write functions or advanced handling of script parameters um to answer your question in the chat i actually mostly google for them so i also i'm not um uh, shell scripts i have one um effect bash scripting for developers yes um this is one um video that i um uh, created just you know to share my tips and uh, uh tips and tricks on on that i'm also not really an expert on bash scripting so for me it's always like pragmatic and i have to google my way around all the time i have to google the syntax for these if uh, else uh, structures and all of that stuff um so yeah i feel you i actually there there's some um, uh, some sites that you can can check out if you uh, if you just like Google for it. There are some tips and uh, and tricks and even some li like books that then will be linked. But just you know search for it and you will uh, you will find this there. Um, so I have some uh, tips here, especially how to you know like uh, the typical error handling and things that I did all over again. So that's in in this video that might be helpful. I hope because I use this all the time, but much more than that, I also don't really use. So if it's into, you know, handling that becomes really, really complex, I would rather actually use a programming language like like Java or something that even like like Java can compile it down natively, where it, get, it gets more complex than just, you know, your some switches, because then it might be a little bit overkill for a bash script, I would say. All right. So one more question: Shall, shall WebSocket server be serverless? It drop a okay, canary, for example, or beats a higher timeouts. Shall WebSocket server be serverless? Um, well, depends. I mean, if your WebSocket by, or oh, you mean by definition can be scaled to zero? Uh, I would say depends on your uh, framework that you use for a serverless, for example, Knative or something similar, it should be. I don't see a reason why. I mean, it's not HTTP, but a WebSocket connection, but it should also, you know, handle scale to zero there quite well as well. Um, so I don't see why it should not. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty, uh, pretty sure that it, that this would work 
um, depending on your cloud setup there. I would probably use something like Quarkus and compile it down natively with GraalVM uh, then, which I usually never do for real world projects. But in this case, if you want, it's not even a question of serverless, it's a question of scale to zero, if I uh, read your question correctly. Um, where then you say you want to scale to zero and then quickly start it up. Um, which yes you can also, I, I don't know why it shouldn't be you have to t uh, test this with the websocket port connection all of it that should work heartbeats of higher timeouts yeah this then depends what you would like to do so um this means that you know if you have a heartbeat of a, a current connection and the timeout that, that's always an interesting thing both with uh, uh um websockets and with service and events um i know this because i just uh use this quite a lot for a project um, where actually you might think of if a serverless or a scale to zero a solution is then the best solution. But in, in order to detect an active connection, yes, I probably would use a, t a time, um, a ping message, uh, like a heartbeat back and forth also from the client. If you see, okay, the client is still there so that the server, server doesn't shut down. Um, timeouts might be a thing as well, but probably you want some sort of heartbeat in this way. MTLS, or there could be one more secure and efficient ways um mtls in general you mean so mtls inside a cluster works really well from experience also for you know real world projects most of them who use some sort of like service mesh mesh solutions such as istio use this out of the box and they're quite happy with it i mean you know mostly it's in um, in between like inter cluster communication if you want it from the outside it's a little bit depends you know because you need to configure quite a bit but usually you are quite happy with that also in projects Okay, so one more question in the chat. What do you think about the Kotlin language? Will this replace Java in the future? Replacing, um, I don't really think so. So um, especially with the re recent Java language features, I, you know, I'm quite happy with just the alternative um, JVM languages out there, but I usually actually don't use them a lot. And the reason is I'm a big fan of plain Java and for me it just doesn't lack much. And most of the syntactical sugar that other languages have is actually not the biggest killer feature for a good comprehensible code, but more like the code that you write, like the structures that you write, the naming that you have, whether you use proper abstractions, whether you use delegation, that makes your code you know, most comprehensible or readable uh, in my mind. But I know many developers who are very happy by using Kotlin or using Groovy or something else. And I like it. I like a lot the fact that this actually incentivizes the Java, um, you know, language to move on. You know, there are many nice features that you might say, OK, Kotlin is this a little bit nicer or whatever. But there are a lot of features that are nicely integrated then into the, the Java language. I mean, lambdas back then were a good example. You know, now records or similar things are just very nice that we have them then in Java after a while. So, and usually, you know, it's just for me fast enough to evolve that and then wait for some Java versions. Um, you know, I, I don't really have some Kotlin feature that I say, okay, I cannot live uh, without that in, in Java. You know, I I don't really, really often, you know, program in Java and think, um, I mean, I often program, but I never really think often that, you know, there, oh, I wish Java had that, or, you know, this is really, really lacking. I mean, yes, there are some some features, like probably the, the best that I can think of is, you know, the, the null safe type system or the, the, the whole thing that you can do in Kotlin, which is just kind of cool. But it's not like that I say, okay, I won't uh, use Java because of that. And I think for most projects, that's that's certainly uh, the case. So um, I think they can just happily coexist as long as both evolve. So I know I certainly uh, don't think uh, that Kotlin will replace Java. It's I would say it's a nice addition and especially, you know, for um, interesting language features, somewhat parallel to Java for uh, people who, who like this a lot. And also it coexists quite nicely in the enterprise world, which I uh, think is, is kind of cool. You can have a look at uh, Quarkus or uh, Spring, you know, on Kotlin, this works quite nicely, actually, also with these all these annotations. So I see this very much in, you know, in a composition. All right, so moving on for another point that helps a lot from my mind. So taking a step back and reflecting once in a while goes back to, I would say, life in general, but also a lot of points that are important in IT, for example, automation. 
Like for example, if you say, well, you know, you always do the same steps in the morning when you start up your computer and start up your environment and things like that, or all of the actual steps while you're coding in your IDE or the stuff you paste into your command line, you know, is there something that I can do in a more effective way? Like for example, some automation that you can write, some keyboard shortcut that you can learn, some alias or shell scripts that you can define, things like that. Or even, you know, to see what am I actually doing the whole day and if there is a better way around or a better way, a use of your time, if there's something, you know, that you have to look up many times and where you actually should write yourself a pointer or some, you know, documentation uh, or somewhere, which really, really helps. And in my mind, this is a very helpful technique to, you know, just have a look at that. And then in general, I would say, you know, this, this helps a lot in life. So I'm a big fan of just doing a journaling and once in a while, just, you know, collect your thoughts and, um, you know, just do this in order to get some new insights to say, oh, actually, why didn't I do this earlier or didn't think of it earlier? From, from my ex um, experience, this helps a lot to just, you know, actually, you know, take, take uh, some time um, to just reflect of, you know, what you can improve. And especially connected also with the point before of owning your time, there's a lot, you know, into this planning where you say, okay, what can I actually do tomorrow? So at the end of the day, it really helps, you know, because, you know, you will have a break for for a whole night and then you might have forgotten what you did work on in, uh, at the end of the day to just, you know, not even do some planning, but al although this helps a lot as well, but basically have some pointers. What are uh, the things that I should start off uh, with in my next day, right? Like where was where there's some function or some test that I was just writing and sort some, you know, uh, comments or some errors in the code that it doesn't compile anymore and you see where you left off or something like this helps a lot um, up to the point that you say okay what is a very small task list of the things I should start with um, and the next day with the high priority uh, thing that I should actually be doing first so this really helps and it's not a big thing it's really like uh, two or maybe five minutes of sitting down of you know just collecting your thoughts what did I do this uh, this day what went well what should have done uh, I should have done better and what are the things that might help me uh, tomorrow which is just also quite um, yeah um, an important thing and something uh, some nice uh, reminder that you can uh, do once in a while okay so some more questions here in the chat Kotlin is very useful for Android APIs, um, but for backend plain Java is uh, enough. I also see it like that. Yeah, somewhat um, agree. Um, how fast did you grow from the beginner uh, to a strong CEO or a like level? In what age did you start software engineering? Is higher education valuable? I mean, being uh, a genius more important than having a diploma? Yeah, a few questions there. So how fast did you grow from the beginner to a strong senior level? very interesting question and i think very important one because in our industry or often in life we kind of like confuse you know years of service or how long somebody uh, did something uh, with actual you know skill or ability i can give you an example uh, when i was i think 14 or 15 years old i started playing the guitar you know um, at first acoustic guitar and then also um, electrical guitar and at that time I was a lot into you know rock and metal music and I played it a lot and you know I actually improved quite a bit because I played you know two hours or more every single day for at least two years and in the first time you know my skills you know went up like this skyrocketed pre uh, pretty much and I could pr play actually quite a bit but then at some point I just you know had uh, different interests and then you know I somewhat plateaued so I still have very few songs that I can kind of play and you know that's that's okay um, and I still you know am able to do them but then of course well you know at some point you just plateau and then you don't improve anymore if you don't put in what I call a deliberate practice or what is called deliberate practice that's not just my term and the point is now you could say well I have you know almost 15 years um, experience of playing the guitar but what, how much does that say, right? Because in the first two years, if I say, well, two years, if you uh, practice a lot, that can be quite a lot. You know, you can play really well. Um, but and for 10 years, even more so, but only if you keep at it. But if it means two years of really good practice and eight years of a uh, little bit or not at all, then how much does that say uh, tell you? And it's the same with IT. So if you meet a person, a senior developer who has 10 years of experience, you know, there's the saying that sounds a little bit harsh, but 10 years of being a mediocre developer doesn't make you senior. 
And I can tell you it's actually true, right? If you go there in a project. Um, so it's much more about the actual learning time, the deliberate practice that you put in. So that means, do you really sit down and you know read the documentation of how your framework works, or try out stuff, maybe even in your uh, free time, you know, or not? But basically, do you keep learning, and how long do you do so? And then also, how quickly do you learn? Which is a much more personal thing, and you cannot really compare this from person to person because some people just learn much quicker. Um, which you can also actually learn to learn. So that's an interesting neuroscientific uh, fact as well. But basically, well, it just depends on, you know, how much practice you put in. So in my mind, I don't really ask the question, hey, how many years of experience do you have? I mean, I ask if I'm interested how long the person, you know, has been working with it, but not in a term of, you know, judging them of saying, oh, you have 10 years of experience, so you're better than the uh, person with uh, five years of experience. Not necessarily, actually. It depends really, you know, how you deal with your job, especially in which um, project environment you're in. Because if you're just working on the same old legacy stuff and you don't grow and you don't, you know, increase your horizon for the last uh, 10 years um, or five years, then, you know, what? how much does it uh, tell you if it now would come into a new project? So this is very much an important point that you just also what I put in, you know, keep learning. That this is just more important than saying, okay, how much um, years of service do, uh, does one have? Um, for me personally, when did I start software engineering? Actually, quite early when I was still in um, in school. So before I, you know, graduated and before I went to university, um, then I was actually uh, interested in just like some very basic programming and uh, website stuff quite early um, during school, and then I worked in some, um, you know, like internet uh, website uh, uh, company. And started with this actually until I gradually went into web applications actually before my studies even. So now it's more than I recently calculated this. I have Java experience for more than 10 years now. So I started at quite an uh, early age, uh, before my 20s definitely. And is higher education valuable? Um, well, it always depends a little bit on the university and everything. So I would say I would. I personally am very happy with that I've done it. So I studied computer science, um, but it was also this uh, university in, in Munich where I did it was very, mal, uh, very much practical oriented, like from the beginning. And also I did this in a somewhat dual studying way where I also worked during my studies, which really helped because of the practical experience. So if anything, I say it's very valuable if you compare it with practical experience, because then you know a lot of the backgrounds that you otherwise just might not have. I mean, you can always you can learn everything on the Internet and even for free, you know, if you want. Um, but there's certainly a lot of be benefit um, uh, in learning that in a you know scientific or in a university environment where you also really get the background, where you get a lot of like facts and where you just have to. Um, you know, deal with some complicated maths and so all of the things just to go through this heavy, you know, boot camp of of learning a lot of complicated stuff, then late that later just helps you. So, you know, being a genius when you say it's more important than uh, having a diploma. Yeah. But what, what what constitutes being a genius? Right. So that's also a question, an important one. Um, of course, you can self study pretty much everything nowadays, especially which is a great, great, great advantage um, advantage that we have in modern times. But, you know, it's not really about the diploma. So I really don't care that much about the, the paper, especially in development work. You know, if you're a good developer and then you're a good developer. And on the other hand, I also unfortunately met quite a few people who actually some of them uh, unfortunately graduated from the same university like I did, who had a master's degree and uh, well, were not the best developers out there in the world. Um, so that also depends because you always know uh, you know, like then back in school, it depends on the, the teacher or then university, you know, the professor, how much they actually, you know, like teach you in terms of practical and really applicable knowledge. So that's another thing to consider. So I would say it always highly depends. All right. So um, I hope that answers the question a little bit. Another question. How do you do time tracking for different customers? I actually used that tool, this day captain tool that I just uh, pasted. Um, um, in the chat because I um, this this can filter and um, oh maybe I can uh, quickly uh, show this here let's do this here there's uh, some uh, so that's uh, the tool I was talking about and then I can do another thing I can 
define some, um, I don't know, areas for it. And, and then I can let's make this a little bit uh, bigger. I can, for example, uh, filter by some uh, specific like client or what, uh, what I do and apply here some, you know, some stuff in my, um, in my calendar. So for example, if I say what I'm doing here now is, let's say I have, you know, these two, let me make, this, make myself smaller. I have this two uh, kind of like test that should be for two different clients indicated by colors here. And then I say, okay, I do uh, this and that at this particular time. And then I could, for example, filter it. Um, if you're interested in that tool, you know, you can just uh, check that out. Um, there's a, a trial version and some, you know, uh, some videos uh, that explain all of that stuff. But basically that's just uh, what, I, what I did. So, you know, spoiler, I, I just created this for my own uh, needs. So that's basically what, uh, what I do. Um, in order to do time tracking, I basically tracked it uh, with, with in, in such a fashion um, or of course then, you know, using some sort of plain text file or even, you know, some sort of spreadsheet when you say you want to actually calculate the hours or something like this. But that's basically what I do. Um, and it's it's not just for time tracking, it's more like not for uh, forgetting about things. For example, when I have like uh, many clients, you know, in a, uh, in a single week, then I just look at, okay, what is actually the time being spent and I can filter uh, by some they're called like areas these colors or I can also um, create some so-called projects that then I can filter by which is just uh, quite helpful and uh, what I'm doing uh, there so it's called day captain if you're interested in you know there's more time uh, tracking there you can check this out here as well okay so this is basically the tips that I um, wanted to show you now a few more things and of course you can ask some more questions so first of all yeah thanks a lot for for joining and for watching this um, live or if you're watching the recording then for for watching that um, a few more things that I want uh, like to point out so you know if you like the sort of topic then I have more content for that uh, for you so you can check out um, my blog on you know all things here uh, productivity especially with some of the you know these uh, shell uh, tips and uh, dot files and all of that stuff that is available there I also have a um, much much bigger fully fledged uh, course and um, video course um, available uh, for that topic which you can uh, check out as well so that's that link uh, here so that's I call this developer productivity masterclass and it's uh, more than 14 hours of content like video content that you can watch on all things developer productivity so you know stuff that I showed you uh, today but also much more about you know the um, the experience of flow and what that constitutes and it will teach you you know more timeless principles how to apply this regardless of the technology that you're using um, and you know also, of course, with tips like, you know, how to use the command line, the keyboard, how to get more effective on that. But um, you can check uh, this out if you want to or if you found this uh, helpful. So that's this uh, productivity course. And then, you know, feel free to uh, follow me on Twitter or if you're um, not already doing, you can subscribe to my YouTube channel. I have a podcast and all of that stuff. But basically, you know, Twitter and my blog, you will find things there. Okay, so... Uh, some more questions in the chat like you know feel free um, to ask uh, this and yes other than that really thanks a lot for uh, for watching and thanks for joining I always enjoy these uh, sort of uh, live streaming um, well it's live streaming sessions because it's also interactive and you get a chance to uh, to join you know they're free for all and you can uh, well hopefully take something away and we have some some sort of interactiveness so it's not just me talking I can respond to your question which is always fun so in this way yes so thanks a lot for uh, for watching for joining you know make sure to check out this material uh, feel free to you know like the video and subscribe to my channel and yes see you soon somewhere thank you very much and bye <laughs>